Russian hockey offensive has been described as a useful example of how Russia exploits Ukraine's weaknesses. Insufficient manpower, lack of artillery shells, sparse air defenses, and inadequate defensive fortifications. The current situation on the entire front line as of the 1st of May, as reported by Vietnamese reporters, is as follows. Ukraine's frontline brigades are holding on as they desperately wait for ammunition from their allies, as well as waiting for new recruits to arrive for much needed human support. In the north, Moscow's army is aiming to put troops in the artillery range of the city of Kharkov. Along the southern front, Russia is trying to gain control of the villages that were recaptured by Ukraine in last year's summer counteroffensive, while trying to advance deeper into Ukrainian territory. Up in the north, the cross-border attacks saw Russian forces quickly take control of several border villages. Since then, Russia has stepped up attacks in the region to gain control of important residential areas in Bobchansk and Lipsy. Lipsy is a town that is located about 30 kilometers north of the city of Kharkiv and is being heavily bombarded by Russia. The Russian attack also forced Ukraine's already thin resources to divert away from other front lines and created a buffer zone from Ukrainian attacks on the Russian border of Belgorod region. On the eastern front, in addition to Kharkiv, Russia mainly concentrated its offensive capabilities in the east, where it has been moving forward since October of last year, when Ukraine's highly anticipated summer counteroffensive failed last summer. Seizing the industrial center of eastern Ukraine, known as the Donbass region, remains the Kremlin's main target. In February, the Russians achieved great success by capturing the town of Avdivka. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that he had to withdraw troops to preserve their forces when they faced intense, continuous Russian bombardments, as well as a disadvantage of a 10 to 1 ratio in artillery shells. Since then, the Russian army has steadily advanced in the west in the direction of Pavkrosk, which serves an important military center for Ukraine. A few tens of kilometers north, the eastern city of Bakhmut was recaptured by Russia last spring after a nine-month-long battle. Currently, Russian forces are advancing west to Chasivyar, taking control of the high ground where the town is located will bring the Russian army closer to the strategic city of Kramatorsk. And I will report on the updated situation in Chasivya later on in this video. On the southern front, further south, Ukrainian forces are under pressure in the southeast of Zaporizhia, one of the few regions where the Ukrainians had achieved some success, albeit quite modestly, in their counteroffensive of last summer. Russian military bloggers and Ukraine's deep state conflict map both report on Russia's small steps into the recaptured Ukrainian territory. Robotini, a small village now completely destroyed, changed masters several times during the conflict. The village was first seized by the Russian forces in early March of 2022, and Moscow again declared control of it earlier this month, which the Ukrainians deny. The battle for Robotini village highlights the versatility on the battlefield and is a clear illustration of the nature of this Russo-Ukrainian war. The war was decided by devastating skirmishes in our often abandoned villages. So with that update, let's get into some of the more detailed aspects of the front line in today's video. So in an article published in the Long War Journal on the 24th of May, the Russian diversionary strategy in Kharkiv was explored a bit further. The article stated that although Russia's offensive near Kharkiv has grabbed much public attention, Moscow continues to focus its main effort on taking the rest of the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. Russian forces reportedly made incremental gains on the eastern front over the past few weeks, most notably near the small but militarily significant city of Chasiv Yar. Now, while Russian advances have been minor, the situation is unstable due to Ukraine's manpower shortage, and the Kharkiv offensive has, and I quote here, further stretched Ukraine's forces. The author of the article states that after some quick and initial gains, Russian progress in the Kharkiv direction has largely stalled. The offensive, however, has achieved some success, 
in its likely goal, which is to compel Kiev to divert much-needed forces elsewhere. Ukraine began transferring units to the Kharkiv area a few days before Russia launched its offensive there on the 10th of May. Additional forces appear to have been subsequently redeployed to that area. Some of the units sent to the Kharkiv direction were previously defending Chasevya and neighboring villages. Following the redeployment, Russia had managed to gain some ground in the Chasevya sector. In the weeks prior to the Kharkiv offensive, the situation around Chasevya had appeared to stabilize for the Ukrainian army. Russia had launched its push at Chasevya in early April. By mid-month, Moscow's forces had captured the village of Bogdanivka, northeast of the city, and had taken positions on the outskirts of the Canal Micro District in eastern Chasevya. South of that district, Russian forces advanced to the eastern edge of the Sivirsky Donetsk Donbass Canal, which splits the city and provides a natural defensive obstacle. But according to the journal, Russian advances then stalled. The Russians then appeared to switch tactics, reducing its use of armored fighting vehicles or AFEs. The Russians had initially conducted regular mechanized assaults in the Chasivya area. The opening attack launched in early April reportedly involved up to 32 armored fighting vehicles, while subsequent attacks seemed to stay below the company level. As time passed on and Russian vehicles' losses mounted, the Ukrainian soldiers said that the Russians began emphasizing even smaller scale assaults by infantrymen riding quad bikes, motorcycles, and utility terrain vehicles. However, Moscow's Kharkiv offensive has coincided with an uptick in Russian mechanized attacks in the Chasevya area. Ukraine has repelled most of them, they claim, but Russian forces have achieved advances that, while modest, could augur further progress, according to the article. Russia has launched a series of attacks into the Canal Micro District. One of these attacks on the 17th of May reportedly comprised some 20 armored fighting vehicles from the 98th Guards Airborne Division. Russia has since conducted additional smaller scale mechanized attacks in the area. While Ukrainian defenders have knocked out many of the vehicles, some managed to deliver troops to buildings within the Canal area. Now at the time of this article, it was unclear whether Russians had managed to secure a foothold in that area. But regardless, what is clear is that Ukraine's grip on the micro district was described as slipping. Russian glide bombs have decimated many of the buildings that Ukrainian troops use as defensive positions. Additionally, as at the 25th of May, Russia had taken a few square kilometers of territory south of the Canal Micro District, according to Ukrainian Deep State Project. The Russians thus expanded their presence near the canal and within Ivaniski, which is a village southeast of Chasevya that Russia has partially controlled for months. Earlier this week, social media footage indicated Russian forces have also gained a little ground in Kleshivka, which is another village southeast of Ivaniski that Ukraine retook during its 2023 counter-offensive. Troops from Russia's 6th Motor Rifle Division advanced into the southern part of Kleshivka and raised the flag in the village. The village, however, remains in the grey zone with Ukrainian troops still controlling dominant heights to the west and the northwest. Capturing Kleshivka and the nearby high ground would make it easier for Russian forces to cross the canal south of Chasevya. Russia could then cut off the eastern parts of the city Russia could also attempt to develop Chasevya by pushing to the village of Stepokny, south of the city. Indeed, taking Chasevya would bolster Russia's position heading into the expected summer offensive, possibly translating into further advances. The city is located on the high ground, which would provide an advantage to Russian first-person view drone crews and allow Russian artillery to bombard the nearby city of Konstantinivka an important logistics hub, as well as the settlements along the highway from there to the city of Kramatorsk. Now, while Russian progress on the Eastern Front remains incremental, its gains reflect a Ukrainian manpower shortage that will take a lot of time to resolve. 
The Kharkiv Offensive has compounded this challenge, and Russia may very well launch another smaller offensive further north to the Sumy region, of which I made a video right here, to further stretch the Ukrainian forces. Moscow likely, likely hopes that attrition and sustained pressure on multiple axes will eventually lead Ukrainian lines to collapse somewhere along the Eastern Front. For now, Ukraine's forces appear to be holding. Time will tell whether Kiev can mobilize sufficient manpower to stabilize the front lines. In the meantime, Ukraine's only hope is to make Moscow gains as costly as possible to reduce the Russian offensive potential. Now the question of how well Ukraine is performing this attrition strategy is unclear, but it remains doubtful given their paucity of artillery and manpower to inflict the necessary damage. German newspaper Welt produced an intelligence assessment on the 24th of May which stated that it is not expected that Kiev will succeed in regaining the initiative in 2024 and stated that presumably Ukraine will suffer, and I quote here, significantly greater terrain losses by the end of the year than in the months since January. It reports that the artillery deployment of the Russians is significantly stronger than that of the Ukrainians, and above all, Russia can more than compensate for its losses. Kiev, on the other hand, is not able to call in enough soldiers to compensate for losses nor to form sufficient reserves. The new rules of mobilization would only have an impact at the end of summer because recruits would first have to be trained. And this training of new Ukrainian troops is to be done by NATO allies, perhaps even closer to the Eastern Front Line where fighting is heaviest and which I reported on in my last video could easily trigger a NATO-Russia conflict should any of those NATO trainers come within the range of Russia's artillery and aviation. The Welt magazine assesses that the expected terrain losses of Ukraine are a consequence of the current, and in quotations again, defensive orientation of the Ukrainian armed forces and associated delay battles. Ukraine wants to save personnel and is currently buying time by dispersing space. Kiev, it says, hopes to gain time for mobilization and the reconstruction of its own military industrial complex. However, Russia's strikes on that said military industrial complex of Ukraine could become a serious problem. It says that the narrative of the hopelessness of the resistance can only be overcome if Chancellor Olaf Scholz's slogan that Ukraine will be helped as long as is necessary is replaced by an all-in strategy. And this, it seems, may be the desperate stage that NATO allies have reached with recent comments as illustrated in my previous video. This is why the Welt magazine reports that Ukraine must be allowed to attack with Western weapons on Russian production facilities, depots, and provision spaces in Russia itself. But this recent escalation from the West appears to be more of a sign of weakness and desperation rather than being indicative of any military strength. Both the Daily Telegraph and Scott Ritter in Russia Today speaks of Ukraine approaching its final defeat soon. The Daily Telegraph said that without Western weapons, Ukraine may only have months left. It viewed that President Zelensky's request for both Joe Biden and President Xi to attend a peace summit in Switzerland to be indicative of, and I quote, President Zelensky's awareness that Ukraine's time is simply running out. Scott Ritter's article in Russia Today was far more illuminating and is worthy of a standalone video. His well-written article lays out the background for where we are today from a Russian strategic perspective. He comments, as I have, that Russia's strategic goal has always been demilitarization of the Ukrainian army, which initially could have been achieved in 2022 by defeating the Ukrainian military on the battlefield, and that Moscow, he says, was well on its way to achieving that goal after it pulled back its forces from Kiev. Thereafter, Russia moved to phase two, which was the liberation of the Donbass region. Mr. Ritter views that the battles of May and June of 2022 nearly brought the Ukrainian army to its breaking point. This was when Russia seized large cities like Mariupol, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and the entire Luhansk Oblast. It was only the decision by the collective West to provide massive infusions of military 
resources that saved Ukraine and permitted their fall 2022 counter-offensives. But just as I pointed out in my videos on the Kharkiv and Husan 2022 twin offenses, those military successes for the Kiev regime proved to be their undoing, as they, buoyed by false hubris, NATO and its allies encourage Ukraine to repeat that success in 2023, which of course proved to be disastrously in vain. Mr. Ritter's last paragraph summarizes everything that is reported on in this video. The goal of a war of attrition, he says, is to wear your enemy down to the point where the continued resistance is impossible. This has been Moscow's goal since April of 2022, and it remains its primary goal today. The Kharkiv Offensive is simply the current manifestation of the continuation of this strategy and the clearest indication yet that the Russian endgame in Ukraine is drawing near.